call the uh, San Antonio Greenville Transportation Commission meeting for February 7th to order here in beautiful Scotts Valley. Can we uh, begin with the roll call? Commissioner Rodkin? Here. Commissioner Bachmore? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Commission Alternate Mulhern? Present. Commissioner Alternate Shipman? Here. Commission Alternate Gregorio? Here. Commissioner Coffin Gomez? Present. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Bertrand? And Commissioner Love? Here. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin with uh, oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the purview of this discussion. You'll be allowed three minutes to come up and speak. Hi, Brian People Trail now. Um, just wanted to point out again, Guy, we feel that you made a significant error in, in moving forward with the, the contract with Progressive Rail. And we're encouraging you to uh, look at the members who are supporting and not supporting that. Bruce, Brandy, and think about the, the members who did support it. They have the, an ideology um, against uh, the automobile, widening the highway, and that trains are the solution. And I'll, I'll, I'll point to Mike here as the, the case in point. Sorry, Mark. Um, you know, you're basically your ideology of the hatred of the car denies... Uh, denies other transportation solutions, uh, denies the allowing that corridor to be used today as a game changer. Not sure who you're representing, you're not representing the metro, you're not representing the people who could benefit today from that corridor opening up. It's, we need to open it now. The million dollar study showed that five times as many users would use that corridor today versus the train. That's what the study showed. And keeping that corridor closed is wrong. It's a great example of why this board needs to be an elected board. We need more people focused on true um, focus. Um, John's not here, but I'll just point out that John also has that ideology. Now he's coming out saying he wants a sky camp I don't know how a sky camp, how the Save Our Skies people will react to a sky camp. Um, it's not the direction our community needs to move. John actually made an incorrect statement. We've been talking to the Surface Transportation Board and the CTC. He tried to point out that the C Surface Transportation Board is going to take forever. Well, no, John's been taking forever. This organization has owned that property for almost a decade now. And you've done multiple studies, and we need the corridor open today. And it's a shame that we've given the way that property to an out-of-state organization. And Guy, um, you haven't followed through with your commitment to reach out to the community. You've been reaching out to the train supporters, but we gave you a 10,000 signatures for no train. Brian, so, right, can, can so your comments to the commission? Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, so we're we're looking for more of an outreach for people who don't support the train, and we're disappointed with the progressive rail contract. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak during an open conversation on anything that's not on the agenda? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, any additions or deletions to the agenda? The only thing that I need to let you know is that closed session today is not necessary. Okay, thank you. Not the items, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> now move us to the consent agenda. These are items that are normally dealt with in one vote. Is there anyone from the commission that should pull anything on the consent agenda? Anyway, from the public, pull anything. I'd like to speak on the Highway 1 update. Sure, come on up. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I just want to call your attention to the uh, bus on shoulder study that was completed last summer. Uh, according to that study, there could be a, uh, a bus on shoulder lane, a, a bus only lane on the southbound direction 
It would cost $12.2 million. And uh, they, that study didn't investigate the northbound direction because it assumed that the bus on shoulder would be uh, part of the auxiliary lanes. But I think that would be a good next step to, to ask, you know, how much would it cost without the auxiliary lanes? Because uh, as you probably know, the auxiliary lanes were meant to widen the highway to the ultimate width of the HOV project. So that would be four lanes in each direction, HOV lane, two through lanes, and an auxiliary lane. And so it's a much larger paving project than would be needed for a bus only lane. So I, I also think that it's an advantage to proceed with the bus on shoulder project uh, without doing the auxiliary lanes from the time standpoint, because there are only funds to do, uh, from Measure D, there are only funds to do the auxiliary lanes down to State Park Drive, right? After that, what do we need? Another tax measure to, to, to do the rest? So that could be well into the future, whereas the bus only lane investigated by this feasibility study said from Santa Cruz to Freedom Boulevard, with a couple of exceptions in between, could be done right away for the $12.2 million. So uh, I'm really looking at the people from Watsonville to notice that the auxiliary lanes are not gonna help your commuters. Uh, the EIR on the next segment of the auxiliary lane, which is Soquel Avenue to 41st Avenue, concluded that there would be a marginal time savings benefit in the morning commute, and it would actually delay the evening commute. Uh, so I don't think it benefits Watsonville folks, and I think uh, it would be much more timely and effective to do bus on shoulder. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Okay, with that, I'll bring it back to the agenda. Second. Um, motion and a second. Motion by Watkins, second by Shulman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Um, we'll go to uh, the regular agenda now. Um, begin with the uh, any commissioner reports on RTC related items. Any commissioner? Mr. Johnson in your hometown. Yeah, well, thank you, Chair. I just, on behalf of the citizens of Scotts Valley, I want to welcome everybody uh, to our. Uh, lovely city um, and as uh, usually is appropriate um, I have somebody from staff that wants to talk a little bit about a few of the projects that are going on for uh, two or three minutes if that's acceptable. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Taylor Bateman who is our community development director. Um, he'll give us an uh, update on things from the Glenwood Trails to uh, Crossing. All right. Good. Am I on here? Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for uh, allowing us to give this update for you guys. Um, so welcome to the city of Scotts Valley. Um, there's lots of great projects going on here right now, and I'd like to walk you through a couple of them. Um, a lot of them you guys are aware of. They've been done in partnership with the RTC as well, so thank you for your support on a lot of these projects. Um, so the first one uh, Commissioner Johnson mentioned is the Glenwood Project. Uh, in the north end of the city, we have the Glenwood open space area, and we've recently opened that to the public. We've created a trail system there on the west side that connects with the high school. It's about approximately five miles of trails, um, and it connects with the high school. It's been a great, great amenity for the community. The community's really embraced it, and it's utilized it. The Glenwood project also has a phase two component. That's the east side of the preserve. We will be opening up trails there, hopefully in the near future. The planning phases are uh, well underway on that project. In that same area, the Glenwood area of the City of Scotts Valley, um, we're also in the design phase for over a thousand feet of Glenwood Drive improvements beginning at the high school and continuing to the northern border of the City of Scotts Valley. That will be utilizing SB1 money for that project. Um, so the next project we have on the go, actually it's a complete project, and this one was a, a fairly big undertaking for the city and it's, a, it's been a real benefit as well. Um, this is the intersection improvements that were done at the intersection of Mount Herman Road and Scotts Valley Drive. That included um, multiple bike lane improvements, pedestrian friendly improvements, improved the intersection timing, and most importantly added a left turn lane that really improves traffic flow through there. But not only did we improve traffic flow through there, we were able to um, shorten crosswalk distances and improve the timing of the pedestrian experience there as well. 
Um, that also included some really um, new stuff for the city of Scotts Valley in that we added the uh, green bike, pedestrian bike boxes at that intersection. So that is a, it's a very busy intersection, so that was a great addition for uh, cyclists in the city of Scotts Valley. Uh, moving on to the heart of Scotts Valley, on Kings Village Road, um, we've embarked on a sidewalk project there, and that's nearing completion. That consists of approximately 700 feet of sidewalk with uh, multiple ADA compliant ramps, and, uh, and the sidewalk is probably the most important thing. That sidewalk will connect Mount Herman Road to the Scotts Valley Transit Center. Very busy corridor, no sidewalks there previously, so this is a, a great addition there. That project also includes um, a flashing beacon crosswalk for uh, people to get from one side of the shopping center to our post office and back and forth. It's utilized by a lot of school kids as well. So again, a great project there. And that is um, almost, almost nearing completion there as well. Um, another flashing beacon project that we did for a crosswalk is on Vine Hill School Road. And this is um, a very, very important one there too because there's a lot of school kids and activity there on a busy, busy street as well. So another great project for the city of Scotts Valley. Um, and lastly, we are um, working on uh, resurfacing about 1.5 miles of street on Green Hills Road. It's a kind of a, somewhat of a rural road, but it serves a major um, commercial or industrial corridor in the city of Scotts Valley. That included bike lanes, crosswalks, sharrows, and this project that I do believe is complete as of now. So that's another great project, and I do believe the RTC was involved in that one as well. Um, on a planning related note, the city of Scotts Valley is updating its general plan right now. And um, over the next several months, we're going to be updating our circulation element. We're actually going to be calling it a mobility element now because we're going to be looking at more than just traffic. We're going to be doing bike, pedestrian improvements. And that process will be uh, hopefully wrapping up in the spring. Uh, we'll then be tying in the land use element with that. And we'll be moving forward to hearings in the fall, hopefully adopting an EIR and approving that project by the end of this year. So that's a brief overview of Scotts Valley projects. I'm not sure if I missed anything, Randy. If I did, go ahead and fill in uh, the th Thank you for that, Taylor. You know, 10 years ago, um, well, first of all, our middle school is located on Bean Creek right down the street and, and very, very close to uh, Mount Herman um, at, uh, at Scotts Valley Drive. And every day, you have a massive number of kids who uh, have, to, have to traverse over Mount Herman. And 10 years ago, uh, there was literally one of the students, an uh, eighth grader, who found herself under a truck uh, and, through the grace of God, uh, escaped serious injury. So we planted another flashing beacon, I think, right there as well to protect the students as they come out because um, it's pretty dangerous. Uh, I mean, uh, you have cars, even though our uh, speed limit is right around uh, 35, you know, when you have that much activity with kids and so forth and sometimes not paying attention, that was another really great addition. So, uh, thanks for that, Taylor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a question about the Glenwood uh, trail system. Sure. Is there a, a, a map available that shows the trail, assi system that, trail system that's available to the public? And could we get a copy or at least I get a copy? Sure. I could, I could mention that to our public works director and we could work on that. Um, the, Preserve area, the west side near the high school, that isn't, a, it's not officially open, but it is open. We'll be having a grand opening shortly so that there'll be trail information there at that time. I think it's um, a real, um, it's a real important accomplishment for putting five miles of trails. I think that's a real uh, and important public improvement. So uh, I personally would like to go and try those trails myself. Absolutely. So it would be nice to have a map. Yeah. So thank you. We'll reach out to you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, yeah, follow-up question. Um, I actually am on the board of Visit Santa Cruz, and um, I think we just recently got uh, your uh, city manager is, yes. is also on that board. And I was talking with their staff yesterday, so this question came up, and they're very excited about the area. Um, and the question came up, I didn't know the answer. For what uses those trails will be open? Um, bike, pedestrian, uh, you know, hiking, sure. hiking, and Courses, uh, anything else that we should yeah, so it's actually, um, I do see Brian Largay from the Land Trust just walked in. He's been, the Land Trust has been a pivotal partner with the city of Scotts Valley in this endeavor with the Glenwood Open Space area there. So if I misspeak, Brian can, can, can correct me on some of the, uh, some of this, the issues.
issues out there. But basically the plan that's in place right now, it's a very complicated sector. There's a lot of endangered species, a lot of um, different things that are going on out there, wetlands um, and cattle, which are grazing on the site. So um, the West Preserve, Cyber Preserve, which is connected to the high school, that is open for um, uh, pedestrian and mountain bikes. The east side will more than likely just be pedestrian because of the endangered species and stuff that are there. So, does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you for those comments. That's important. Uh, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, I think we're done with Scott Spelling. Uh, well, well, I'm sorry. Commissioner Johnson. I, I just want to say, um, for those of you who don't, don't know what the Glenwood Reserve is, it's about, what, 180 acres of open space yeah. at the north side of town. It's uh, bifurcated uh, by, uh, by the Glenwood Drive, uh, kind of mountainy on the west side, and it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, meadow, and um, you get everything, every every kind of animal from um, coyotes to raccoons to, I don't think there have been mountain lions, but I think maybe there Oh, there's definitely mountain lions there. Yeah. Turtles, turtles, there's a pond there with turtles and fish. They're, it's a, definitely a biologically rich area. So um, in a year or two, I think this will be a really great destination spot for people who want to enjoy uh, trails and uh, open space. So we're pretty proud of the, of the agreement that we made nearly 20 years ago with the developer who built 50 homes there, but donated that land as part of the agreement. So. And one other thing I think that what we were able to do to install now, there was a Safe Routes to School grant that the city got and we were able to connect um, various neighborhoods through the southern portion of the Glenwood area there. It's a route for school kids to go through, but also for the community to use to interconnect neighborhoods, but now access the, the Glenwood area as well. So lots of, uh, lots of good pedestrian improvements. Okay, thank you. It sounds like a very exciting project. I think we're all looking forward to it. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I uh, just want to uh, mention, I, I was at Sacramento all day uh, Monday talking energy and uh, transportation and housing, which I uh, wanted to talk about. I know there's a lot of concern when the governor came out and some legislators mentioned about uh, the need, to, as we all have throughout California, and housing crunch here has, has been discussed a lot. But uh, the proposal or the, the idea was that if that uh, local communities, cities and counties do not build their adequate numbers of housing, um, we will we may take away your SB1 funds, which is about five million dollars for Santa Cruz County every year. Uh, and of course SB1 passed the legislature, there was a referendum uh, on Proposition 6, and that was uh, in November. It lost uh, by a significant margin. Uh, the long and short of it is that the Aggressive posture that was taken or was being taken by some is it's kind of they're stepping back a little. They're getting uh, feedback from League of California Cities, California City Association of Counties. What are you doing to us? Uh, you know, we we want to build housing. We're making some efforts to build more housing, but if we don't meet our arena numbers, the regional housing numbers, um, you're going to take away our housing and transportation funds. That's nuts. And I think that they're getting a lot of pushback. I know there's a lot of concern to every city and county, every local government in the state. Uh, there's not a bill, there's a spot bill with the subject matter, but nothing, no, there's, not, there's not language in a bill to say what they would do in this regard. So uh, that's comforting right now, but uh, if something comes up, we surely want to keep on top of it. And I know we will in each of our cities and counties and our organizations, but uh, uh, it was, it was frightening to hear what they were saying, uh, taking away really our planning procedures in uh, local government, really. Uh, if you don't do what we say, and the state admits that it wants 180,000 houses built every year, and they're getting just barely halfway there themselves, 100,000 kind of collectively throughout the state. So uh, it's an issue. Housing crunch is upon us, but uh, we shouldn't punish transportation to make it work because it will only deepen the problem. But uh, that's where it is at this point. Commissioner Just to point out to the public that when Bruce referred to the spot bill, that's a placeholder in legislation that sometimes at the last minute somebody dumps a bill in there that's shocking and you didn't know what was coming. So I don't know that everybody's aware of that term, but that's, that's what's sitting there, something that could be used at the last minute. So it's really critical that we do a lot of lobbying early on so that doesn't happen. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, I just wanted to 
Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner comments? Okay, we'll move on to the uh, director's report. Thank you, commissioners. The RTC plans to issue a notice of availability of the final environmental impact report for the proposed North Coast Trail later today. The proposed project would comprise the majority of segment five of the larger Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network for which a master plan was adopted and a programmatic environmental impact report was certified. By issuing the NOA today, RTC will provide a four week review period rather than the minimum 10 day review period. Consideration of the certification of the FEIR is currently scheduled for the RTC's March 7th meeting, which will serve as the public hearing for the final EIR. The final EIR will be available on the RTC website and at the RTC's Santa Cruz office. On February 12th, copies should also be available at the downtown Santa Cruz and Watsonville Public Libraries, as well as the Davenport Resource Service Center. I'm proud to announce that the North Coast Trail Draft EIR has been nominated to receive a merit award from the Association of Environmental Professionals. The awards are expected to be presented during the upcoming AEP conference, which will be in Monterey from March 24th through March 27th. I expect to have more information on this event at the RTC's next meeting on March 7th. The comment period for the mitigated negative declaration for phase two of segment seven of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail closed yesterday. Phase two of segment seven extends from California Street and Bay Street to Pacific Avenue. The City of Santa Cruz is the lead agency and its planning commission is scheduled to consider the document at its evening meeting on March 7th which coincidentally is the same date that the, this commission is expected to conduct the hearing on the North Coast EIR. So there will be a very busy day for the Monterey Bay Trail uh, on March 7th uh, coming up. Phase one of segment seven, um, same segment that phase one of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail from Natural Bridges to California Street and Bay Street across the west side of Santa Cruz is scheduled to be rebid for construction by the city this spring. The project is expected to be completed by the end of the year. Finally, on January 30th, the California Transportation Commission allocated $2.57 million in state transportation improvement program funds to prepare the final plan specifications and estimates, also known as final design, for the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane and the Bike Pedestrian Overcrossing Project from Soquel Drive to 41st Avenue. As previously reported, RTC has hired Mark Thomas and company to complete the final design plans. Design is expected to be completed next year, and this project is scheduled to go to construction by the end of 2020, dependent on a full funding plan for the construction phase of the project. And we will be uh, submitting applications to the RTC for, for uh, consideration of construction funding there during the next round of uh, SB1 funding. That's all I have for today. Any questions of the director? Okay. <clears throat> sure, come on up. Right, people's trail now. So I want to remind the organization that uh, the farmers on the North Coast have been actively reaching out to the RTC staff on addressing a win-win solution for the North Coast Rail Trail. Um, we haven't been reached out to, the farmers have not been reached out to, and there's a lot of concerns there. So we're asking that RTC staff really try to make an effort for a developing a win-win. We've reminded you multiple times that we're the first neighbors that you're imposing the new trail on, and the farmers are supportive of it. We have the alternative plan, trail now and uh, farmer's plan. And from the EIR showed that our plan actually had less of an impact. So we're continuing to ask that RTC staff work with the farmers on a win-win solution and don't, and we're the first of the neighbors that you're imposing the trail on. 
So we're really asking for a reach out. It's not happening. I don't know how many times we have to keep asking. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got a public hearing at 9.30. Mr. Lee, I'm going to have you do your presentation. I think you're probably going to be able to expedite that. Absolutely. Go ahead. Absolutely. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, just uh, highlighting the obvious, I suppose. Uh, winter storm season is in full swing. Please take extra time to get to your destination. The system is holding up reasonably well, considering the deluge that we faced um, all over the district, uh, uh, including in Santa Barbara. We had some cleanup with some minor debris flows, but uh, nothing, um, nothing we couldn't handle um, in uh, a day's time. Uh, also, just wanted to highlight, uh, there's more information for you um, on our shop projects. We recently shared with your staff our semi-annual list of all the shop program, including uh, what's lo looking ahead far to the future so that we can do a better job of coordinating with you um, as part of our asset management program. Um, and I'll just leave it at that unless you have some questions for me. Any questions? You have a couple more minutes if you want to elaborate. <laughs> Um, I don't want to cut you short. No, I, I really don't need to, other than to just comment maybe on the Highway 9. I'm really, I know we've got a hearing coming up, but I just want to say how pleased we are to have been able to, to help sponsor that effort, and it's been a really um, positive experience for everyone involved. And uh, I was at the open house last night, which was a, uh, a good event, and I look forward to today's hearing, and your, your staff is doing a fabulous job, and hope good things. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that report. Okay, that takes us to uh, item 17, which is a uh, public hearing on uh, draft Highway 9 Santa Rosa Valley Complete Streets Corridor Plan uh, staff presentation. Good morning, Commissioners. Rachel Murphy and your staff. Um, thank you all for being here today. We do have a public hearing that's been noticed for 9.30 a.m., but we're allowed to start the staff presentation before that, and we'll have the public hearing as soon as we finish the brief staff presentation. So um, I just want to start out by giving a shout out to Brianna Goodman of our staff. She's a planner with the commission, and we were really hopeful that she would be making this presentation today but she is now officially on maternity leave. And so I am presenting, but she's here as a member of the sort of public in case some <laughs> detailed questions come up. But I just wanna recognize she did a lot of work on this plan and also is an SLV resident and um, has just put, poured her heart into this, her first baby, the San Lorenzo Valley Highway 9 plan. Um, so why did we prepare this plan? We went after a Caltrans grant, as Ms. Lowe um, mentioned earlier, and we were successful in securing a grant to come and pull together a more comprehensive plan for the San Lorenzo Valley um, with a focus on high, the Highway 9 and the roads that it, uh, attach to Highway 9. Um, it's focused on improving mobility for everyone, not just automobiles, but also transit, bikes, and pedestrians, um, trucks, uh, emergency vehicles, etc. Um, and it really is a community based plan. We did a lot of public outreach during phase one of the report. Um, Supervisor McPherson had done a lot of um, work with the community starting in 2013 to gather input on what the priorities need to be for San Lorenzo Valley for addressing um, some pretty significant transportation challenges up there. And so we really feel like this is a community-based plan that reflects what we've been hearing from the community. Um, it's also meant to be a toolkit for future implementation of projects. It also can be a toolkit for all local jurisdictions. Um, Appendix A of the document is kind of a guidebook to um, different types of transportation facilities, what the state and federal rules, and sometimes the county rules are associated with those different improvements, whether it's you know, where can you do a crosswalk that looks like this, or a bike lane that looks like that? You know, how wide do travel lanes need to be? Um, where is it appropriate to put certain types of lighting? All of that type of information is also in this document. So we hope it's utilized not just um, for the Highway 9 corridor, but for other um, roads in the, in the county as well. And then finally, the reason why we needed this plan is, well, Measure D, fortunately, includes $10 million designated for Highway 9 through um, San Lorenzo Valley. It's not enough to do everything that's needed in the valley. And so we wanted to really make sure that we're using the public's funds as efficiently as possible and also using those Measure D funds to leverage other grants um, over the years. So hopefully we can 
I think Commissioner um, McPherson suggests quadruple or more of those Measure D funds. So this, is, this was a huge team effort. Um, the Regional Transportation Commission was the lead on the project, but County Public Works, Caltrans, Santa Cruz Metro, um, Supervisor McPherson's office, and our consultant team of Kimley Horn and Trail People were um, helped develop this plan and did a lot of editing <laughs> sections of it. And, um, and then, of course, as I mentioned before, the SLV community was the most involved, I would say. Um, over 400 people filled out a survey that we did around the first phase, and about 100 people came to uh, public workshops when we first uh, kicked off the project. So as I mentioned before, this study doesn't cover all of Highway 9. It's really focused on the section of Highway 9 and the adjacent streets that are um, located in San Lorenzo Valley. Um, there was a study done in 2006 that focused on bicycle and pedestrian access through the valley all the way down to the city of Santa Cruz and looked at a range of different routes, including Grand Hill Road, um, the Big Trees Railroad corridor, as well as Highway 9. Um, but, and that study still exists, it's still valid, but this one really just focused in on what might be possible and needed in the, in the valley itself. So um, for folks who aren't familiar with San Lorenzo Valley, there's a lot of challenges there. We have a lot of folks just walking on the shoulders. Um, there's very limited uh, pedestrian facilities outside of the village course. Um, and even within the village course, there are oftentimes some major gaps, folks walking through parking lots or parking spaces. Um, to get from place to place um, access to the schools. There's very few walkways that provide access to the schools in San Lorenzo Valley. In fact, there might be none. Um, <laughs> there's a side asphalt path um, near uh, Boulder Creek Elementary, which is helpful, but it's it's still not um, fully addressing all the safe routes to schools needs. Um, there's no <coughs> delineated bicycle and pedestrian, uh, bicycle lanes through the corridor. It has huge collision rates, folks driving off the side of the road sometimes on a curvy road, um, head-on collisions, T-bones, all sorts of challenges there. And then there's a few spots with congestion, um, especially around San Lorenzo Valley School Complex and um, the Grand Hill Road, Highway 9 intersection, um, as well as there are challenges for everyone who, especially if folks are trying to turn left from side streets onto Highway 9, but um, they can be sitting there for a very long time waiting to make those turns. It's a narrow roadway, it has sharp curves, we have hillsides, there's a lot of right-of-way challenges within this area. And so putting together a plan that's um, feasible is also a challenge. You know, there's definitely engineering solutions to all sorts of things if you put enough dollars on it, but we really needed to take into consideration that funds are limited as well. Um, so through uh, discussions with the community during phase one, but also looking at what types of criteria exist when um, we're going after grants, we looked at a variety of goals and objectives for the corridors and looked at projects against these goals and, uh, and criteria to see that we were achieving improvements for the corridor. So these range from um, re you know state goals to reduce vehicle miles traveled, but also um, community goals to um, make it easier to walk places, as well as, um, but the most critical one that came up over and over again is safety. Folks want this corridor to be safer for everyone. Um, these are, uh, there's some corridor-wide project types within the, the plan, but overall there's uh, 34 project priorities that were identified through the public input, um, and those are described in chapters two and three of the document. And these projects would apply corridor-wide, and they um, improve transportation safety and mobility for all modes. And um, it provides a road, block, a road map for implementation later. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to our consultant, Frederick Venture, who's here. And some of you may recognize him from other projects that he's worked on. But today, we're just talking about the Highway 9 SLB corridor right now. And so with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, uh, uh, Commission members and members of the public. Um, so, very exciting, very challenging project. Uh, Rachel will just explain to you um, really the constraints that we have, and every um, hundred yards of, of this corridor has constraints on it. Uh, there is, it's a tremendous 
um, challenging um, uh, corridor in terms of providing that multi mobile but we've tried to develop and I think there's a good 40 or 50 projects that's in the back in the appendix and um, that we've um, you know, focused on and developed some sort of system that can be looked at in that toolkit it's really a great toolkit for moving forward and implementing um, the corridor plan <clears throat> so the focus is on pedestrians uh, the focus is on bicycles and then transit, and then also uh, to a more limited extent, uh, vehicular traffic. So people already move, so how can we decrease speeds? How can we make it safer for pedestrians and bicycles specifically? A lot of the emphasis went on that. Um, emphasis also uh, varies between the actual segments between the towns, um, and that's a lot of the corridor projects or the more system-wide projects that, um, that, that Rachel spoke about. And then in the towns, we try to focus it on what is the specific need that the people um, and the community want to see in the town. So formalizing the, the town uh, space and the use that's available and the space that's available there for use by the community. So we'll talk through those real quick. So on, on the pedestrian facilities, number one is just to fix what's there that's not right. So there's sidewalks, there's sidewalks that are just really old, it's not ADA compliant, so that's number one. Number two is filling in the gaps for, for sidewalk space. Um, how do we make sure that, um, that the, 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 we close gaps? Because some, some legs you'll see somebody walks on the sidewalk, then they're back in the street, then they're on the shoulder, then there's no shoulder. So having consistency that you can feel if you're a pedestrian, that you feel safe and that you can actually walk on a sidewalk that's protected, and this is within the towns. Um, the next uh, one that's really, really important is so pedestrians need to cross the street. And last night, again, we heard at the community meeting, there's mid-block crossings that are just purely jaywalking. How can we uh, make it safer for, for people to cross the road? Um, we have 15 accidents over 10 years at intersections where there are striped crosswalks right now. So safety plays a huge um, factor in how we um, improve it at the intersection. So how are we doing that? Um, you can see at the picture, ladder crosswalks highlight that. Uh, not just doing this, a stripe that goes from left and right. You can see those well. Um, you can use reflective painting in these. So at nighttime, when the cars light shine on them, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, they stand out. Um, there's a mid-block crossing that we're recommending and we can use the, it's called the RRFB, it's a rapid flashing device and there's one in Ben Lomond right now, so it's this one that's on the side of the road and if a pedestrian pushes the button they go like berserk and lots of light. So they work really, really well, Galpan supports these, um, so we'll, we'll probably see more of the installation of those. And then we're also looking at, um, so as a pedestrian crosses the road, that having a, what we call a median refuge. So the pedestrian only crosses one lane, get to the median and there's a safe space where there will be protection on both sides and then they cross the other lane. So two stages crossing for pedestrians that will improve safety. Having some more signs that will tell them, hey, crossing ahead, those will be bright and um, so, so road motorists can see them. Bicycle facilities, so between the villages, uh, that's where the biggest challenges are. If you go look at the roadway, you know, to provide anything that really meets great Caltrain standards and what sort of the industry is, is doing out there right now, we need to wipe out trees or we need to widen bridges or there's just no right of way. So what we're recommending is to add a four foot shoulder as maintenance projects are being done to Highway 9 and that four foot shoulder could then be used by bicycles um, in between the villages. We have a few choke points for, for traffic um, that, that are um, actually pretty substantial on the corridor. The first one is Grand Hill and Highway 9. And we had a, quite a few nice graphics that were floating around about how to improve it, but none of them to, to, to go really into traffic congestion resolution uh, did not need significant right away. Um, it's a skew intersection. It's got an offset split, so just sort of everything goes wrong in that intersection for traffic. So what we decided to focus on is really focus on pedestrians, bicycles, and then in that same process, we lengthen left turn pockets, uh, make sure that there's a bus turnout for the bus stops, um, so that the buses don't block the, block the cars they want to go through the intersection. Uh, the other big choking point is actually at the two schools, the San Lorenzo Valley schools. Um, so we have um, identified what I would call short-term, medium improvements. We've had a meeting with the school district and the school representatives to think about the longer-term plan. And they've actually come up with a great idea, but it is going to be extremely expensive, um, big retaining walls, but it is um, captured in the plan as well as a potential solution moving forward. 
the number one uh, cause of accidents um, on Long Highway 9, anywhere along this project, with vehicles were involved in the speed. And last night, several of the public members of the community came to us and said, how can we reduce speeds? So that's going to be one of, and that's going to be one of the primary focus, I think, from the community and from RTC as to how do we get people to comply to those speeds. Unfortunately, everybody that speeds lives in San Lorenzo Valley, so it's the locals that are the culprits, right? We, um, they, they make up 90% of the trips, so um, there's a story to be told there, and that's usually what we find. Um, so we're thinking um, the speed limit feedback signs that you get, the ones that flash, you get those that work with solar panels, there's some newer technologies in those that actually you can get camera violations, so it takes a picture if you still violate the speed, you don't slow down, um, making the signs more visible, um, especially focusing on, especially when you enter the town, so people do slow down to the 25 or 35 or 30 miles an hour, um, so, and, and, and of course, narrowing lanes, right? So, um, in the towns, you will see in the concepts that we prepared, the lanes going from 12 feet to 11 feet. Um, ITE and the industry has proven that that one foot reduction on lanes actually slow traffic down. Um, around, uh, in between the towns, we stay on 12 feet or 14 feet with lanes, and that has to do with going around the corners and the bends because people will, you know, some trucks get longer, so you don't want to narrow it, otherwise, people are going to go on the shoulder. Um, those are two primary items. Then you will also see on the down in the towns we've tried to create this bit of character that it's that you're leaving the rural setting of the road that has a shoulder to a road that now has a bike lane on each side of it, plus parking, plus sidewalk, so people can feel that I'm leaving the town or I'm getting into the town. So the character changes, so I got to lower my speed uh, as soon as I hit the more what I call it urbanized environment. What we also try to do is, so parking, you will see parking is very informal all along the corridor. Um, some people park diagonal, some people park in parallel, um, others park in at, an, at a, a, a 90 degree angle. So what we did in the towns is in a couple of them we have diagonal spaces that we could fit with a bike lane plus sidewalk. And, um, and, and some of them we just get the parallel parking, but it's going to be a little bit more formalized. So again, lane, turn lane, bike lane, parking, sidewalk. Um, the layouts that we have in the in the plan right now is just a very high planning level layout. So it will be there will be lines on the aerial photo. Of course, the aerial photos are not um, they're not to scale. So sometimes it will look like maybe some of the lines go over some of its property. So once we get into the engineering design level, that detail will be sorted out. Transit will continue to be, and I think will become more important in the future uh, for people that commute up and down uh, San Lorenzo Valley. So what we focused on was enhancing um, access number one to bus stops. So people, there's a sidewalk that you can walk to the bus, and if you get off the bus, then you can walk to your house or your business. Um, so, and then the second one is improving the amenities at the stops. So where we could, having a bus pull-out area, or otherwise having a bench, or um, even uh, a little canopy. Um, the bus stop. We have identified 28 what we call priority improvements. That's off that grand list of 60. There's a big old matrix in the back. It, it kept changing. So, so these 28 location-based priority projects and concepts um, <coughs> shows us um, what improvements are anticipated, and we've identified specific locations, and we have a plan in every town: Felton, Benlow, and Brookdale, and Boulder Creek and then some key um, locations uh, in between the villages as well. Um, there are also nice plans that clearly identify in color how, and the community really love those um, at the community meetings. It shows you where these facilities would be provided. It's a very easy step and a very easy um, presentation of, of these multimodal improvements that we've done um, on, on Highway 9. So in Felton, um, again in the town, uh, various improvements, like I said, focusing on pedestrians, bicycles, and sidewalk. Um, there were some crosswalk improvements, um, some center lane improvements, um, the bike lanes, the parking, and uh, transit stop improvements. Um, also identifying specifically some of the routes to schools or parks, um, and having some continuity um, in, in, in that system. Um, the schools, I spoke about already, um, there's a very nice graphic, some very clever ideas, but um, it's going to be very expensive. Um, they do have quite a few problems, both on-site and off-site. Um, 
Ben Lohman, um, the same primarily <coughs> as pedestrian improvements with some bicycle improvements and bike lanes, and then again transit facilities as well. Um, in Brookdale, um, sidewalk improvements, um, some crosswalks, so quite, and quite, quite a few locations we've identified crosswalk improvements that I'll explain to you to enhance how we pedestrians can cross the road and do it in a, in a, in a safe manner. And then in Boulder Creek, um, again, access to the school, um, and then the pedestrian facilities and multimodal improvements along Highway 9, and some connectivity just immediately a block away or some round trip um, from, from Highway 9 into, into the town. Frederick. So again, all of those location-specific um, projects and maps are in Chapter 3 of the document if folks want to dig in a little deeper there and some longer descriptions of all the different proposals. So overall, um, of all of the priorities that floated to the top out of 800 ideas that we got from the community, um, some of them were duplicative, but um, we are going to be challenged to implement all of these projects. And so it's going to happen incrementally. There's going to be some projects that, based on the community input that we've received, we ask people to identify their top five projects throughout all of the you know, 34 project locations. And from that, that will give the Public Works Department, Caltrans, and RTC some guidance on where to go after grants for those major improvements. But for a lot of them, there's going to be some ongoing improvements made incrementally as storm damage repairs happen, for instance, or other maintenance projects are happening out there, or um, as new state mandates related to water control or um, ADA improvements come up. And so there's some of these projects that aren't going to get done all 100% at one time, but maybe a new crosswalk goes in as Caltrans is repaving the roadway. Um, some other components of projects will be um, funded as certain grant applications come forward. We were really lucky, based on all the community input that we received during phase one in our analysis of collision locations, we were successful just last month, or December, sorry, we're already in February, um, of securing a highway safety improvement program grant to address pedestrian uh, fatalities and injury collisions at five locations. So already, you know, we could only look at the locations that had histories of collisions and were also community priorities in that grant application, but as new grants come forward, we'll also be looking to this plan to secure those, those funds. So just to let you know what we've been doing, um, the draft document is on our website um, in full. It has some appendices as well as the core document. We, had, we, issued, we released it for public review on the 17th of January. We have comments due um, next Friday. Um, we've set up an email address specifically for those comments. We've had two open houses in Felton and Boulder Creek that over 100 people attended those two workshops, so that was fantastic. We have today's public hearing, which I anticipate we'll hear from some folks, but we're, you know, whether folks testified at today or they came to the public hearings or they submit comments to us, we've already received over 50 comments. Um, we also have an online survey that over 150, almost 200 people have already taken. Um, so we're collecting input from folks in a lot of different ways, and so we're going to take into consideration all of that input and then come back with a final plan um, later this spring. So um, with that, I recommend that the Commission open the public hearing to receive input from the community, and or we can answer questions that you might have beforehand, whichever you'd like. Thank you. <clears throat> Before I open up for questions, I didn't want to allow uh, Commissioner McPherson a chance to speak in since his office was involved in this heavily. Go ahead. Yeah, I can't tell you how appreciative I am that we're here, and this has really a, uh, become a Highway 9 uh, uh, plan uh, reality, and the, the cooperation that we've received uh, and the, the hard work of our RTC staff is phenomenal. The cooperation with Caltrans has just been great. This is a special circumstance with special challenges, as we know. When you have your uh, state highway being the main street of four communities, uh, literally, and to make that all work together on a county and a state level, uh, it's going to be quite an achievement. We're going to get there. Um, 
I, I can't tell you, especially when you have, it's, uh, I think the highest number of vehicles per day is about 21,000 between uh, Felton and Ben Loman. Heavily traveled, um, and we say we have a cliffside on one side and a canyon on the other, and a lot of spaces. Uh, there's some places where it's going to be difficult to put everything we want into the same package uh, uh, throughout that whole uh, stretch. But I, uh, I think we have to realize too that some of these projects are going to take some time. Like the, the major one, at the, uh, one of the major ones that I mentioned at the schools, where everything from elementary to high school is uh, in one spot, and it's like a parking lot when they're dropping kids off and when you're picking in the morning and picking them up in the afternoon. But uh, we uh, we think that that could be probably four or five years off. But we are in the planning stages and so forth right as we speak. So uh, we're on it, and uh, if, uh, if the voters uh, of Santa Cruz County wouldn't have uh, approved Measure D with $10 million targeted for highway improvements on, uh, or improvements on Highway 9, we wouldn't be here today. And it's going to be a terrific uh, multifaceted transportation uh, project that we have, as was stated, for vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles, and our transit system with Metro. Um, it's been a long time coming. I can tell you that people are engaged. We've had just had a, another hearing last, or a, a public town hall meeting last night in Boulder Creek. Uh, people are engaged, and uh, they really want to see something happen. And uh, uh, it's really nice that we, we've gotten here. As was mentioned, uh, we a separate item we have from some, some flashing beacon lights for people to make crosses, uh, crossings along Highway 9 it has been. Uh, allocated uh, with a grant uh, what, uh, last December, I think just a couple months ago. So uh, I want to thank this commission and everybody who worked on Measure D. And uh, this is something that is very, very significant for the people of San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, people live there, of course, but they commute there too. Uh, a lot of them over Bear Creek Road and not just Highway 17 or getting to 17. So it's, um, it's highly used as uh, the proof in the numbers show, but uh, it's something that's going to be uh, very much appreciated for years and years to come. And I just want to say thank you again to everyone who supported Measure D, and, and including this $10 million fund, which I do believe is going to uh, leave. Our target is to make it grow by at least four or five times that to do the projects that we need. And we probably can't do all of them that are listed uh, even at that. But uh, it's, it's a tremendous uh, feeling for the people in San Lorenzo Valley that uh, we're going to improve the transportation system and the whole network in the valley. So thank you very much. Thank you. Before I open up to the public, is there any uh, questions of uh, commissioners of either Kimley Horn or staff? Mr. Johnson. I have a question. Thank you, Chair. So you mentioned there are a uh, little down to 28 priority <coughs> projects. What is the final price tag on that? You know, um, we did not do cost estimates for individual, for more than I think nine or ten individual projects. But I, my quick and dirty back of the envelope estimate is it's about two hundred million dollars worth of improvements. And we're at ten now. And we're at ten, and two hundred fifty thousand from the HSIP grant. So my my ears always perk up when uh, Kimberly Horn representative mentions transit will become even more important. What is, what is that uh, declarative statement based on? Frederick, do you want to take that? Um, I mean, I could respond to all of the numbers that he So if we um, go look at the um, regional travel plan model, um, we will see that there will be continued growth and increased traffic volumes um, on Highway 9. Um, we know from this study that there is very limited capacity to widen the road to accommodate that traffic. Um, I think the way in which we, people will continue to commute in the future, um, if it gets so congested that um, you know it becomes just bad to stay in your car, is to actually take the bus. Yeah. That that's going to be. I think that's going to be. Uh, we will see, and, and also in the models, we will see that shift. There's a mode shift uh, from away from the motor car more to walking, cycling, and. Any questions? Questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Uh, please come up and uh, make comments. I uh, have three minutes to talk. Anybody would like to speak? 
Go ahead, Ms. Strauss. You can lead us off. Okay. Good morning, Yamaka Strauss with Lake Santa Cruz County. Thank you so much for moving the San Lorenzo Valley Highway 9 Complete Streets plan forward. We are thrilled to see some of these projects come to fruition. And we understand that there are funding limitations. And while there are several, several projects in this uh, plan that are really, really important, there are some that float to the top for us. We urge you to prioritize bike and pedestrian facilities um, to the San Lorenzo Valley School campus. Connections to the southern and northern neighborhoods does not only increase safety for children um, who are already biking and walking in the shoulder of Highway 9, um, but it also creates an opportunity to reduce traffic congestion by allowing parents to choose not to drive their kids to school. Additionally, it's a high priority for Bike Santa Cruz County to provide safe routes in town centers. So we ask you to please prioritize bike lanes and green lanes there. And this will be the start, what we think is the start, of a network of facilities that will get people from point A to point B. So thank you for bringing these projects forward, and we are excited to see them implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Welcome. The studies quoted for lane width, you've chosen to uh, reduce the lane width in the towns by one feet. The studies indicate that uh, the highest pedestrian and non-vehicle safety is at 10 feet. And not marking the lane and what, changing the width of the lanes uh, for the corners uh, does not actually reduce speed because the vehicles who are undersized will use the, the wider lane width and drive faster. It's the, it quotes the, the, the study that says that the narrower lane widths are safer and prioritize uh, bicycles and uh, pedestrians over vehicles, but the wider lanes are for faster traffic, not for 30 mile an hour roads. Um, our entire highway is currently has a varied lane width the entire uh, the entire duration, and a consistent lane width um, suggests to put uh, put the cab of the vehicle in the correct position on the lane rather than um, rather than uh, cutting across, which reduces the safety of bicycles. Um, also, placing um, parking on the far side of the bike lane reduces the safety of uh, cyclists and reduces the number of parents willing to um, send their um, uh, send their, their kids out on bicycles. Um, and in um, our uh, description, um, figure 2.14, it shows the um, uh, how, how in the village you want to put the, the, the parking uh, between the bike lane and the sidewalk. Our sidewalks are not always going to be able to be um, ADA compliant because of their width. Um, and uh, people using, um, you know, using mobility devices will use the bike lane. And that's fine, but it's better if the bike lane is close to the, uh, pedest uh, to the pedestrian access so they can get in and out of the bike lane without uh, going around parked vehicles. Oh, um, Stacy Croft. I, I live in Ben Loma. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Croft. <clears throat> Come on up, sir. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, my name is Jim Helmer, 10885 Alba Road, Ben Loman. Uh, if I could, I'd like to start off with an email conversation I had with uh, Deputy Director of Caltrans long before this study started. Uh, and it, I think it's important not only for some of the points we've heard, but statewide. So this is me in, in my approach to, to the direct, Deputy Director. I appreciate you looking into these three safety issues. Regarding the speed radar shots in downtown Ben Lomond, it is with irony that the section that is very uncomfortable going 30 miles per hour and has a lot of pedestrian and turning activity with our market, the fire department, 
a sloping grade, a curve, offset intersections, and now a rapid flashing beacon on a very challenging uncontrolled marked crosswalk that this cannot be studied on its own merits for a speed reduction. I know you cannot do anything given the current regulations and guidance in our policies. So might I ask, if the state law allowed prima facie 25 miles per hour on state highways, would that give you more latitude, uh, would that give Caltrans more latitude to respond to local requests for setting realistic speeds in local business districts where the main street serves is a state highway? Her response, in regards to your question about prima facie 25, you are correct. This would make it much easier for us under CBC section 22352B, the 25 mile power per hour speed limit for school zones applies to both state highways and local streets. However, the 25 mile per hour prima facie speed limit for business districts and residential districts and senior citizen facilities only applies to local streets. For you that are city council members, your public works director or planning directors can work very effectively and efficiently to lower your speed limits to 25. For a state highway, we cannot do that. We must use the engineering speed survey process, which we heard earlier, motorists tend to drive quite fast. So having, having them apply to state highways, she said, would provide us with more flexibility when it comes to setting speed limits on state highways that travel through cities and communities. Following that, I then communicated with our assembly member and I personally drove to Sacramento and met with Secretary Kelly and Under Secretary Annis and I spoke with Director Gordy of Caltrans. To date, nothing has changed. So I asked that Santa Cruz County be a leader and, and, and help our state by revising the CBC so, so that it does not negatively impact so many California communities that have a state highway as their main street. In other words, give Caltrans the option of using prima facie 25. To the study, if I could, a couple of comments. Go ahead. Thank you. I want to thank Bruce. I want to thank county staff, board staff, the consultants. I want to thank all of you for spearheading Measure D and especially the $10 million set aside. When Bruce took office, he met with each community and we set some priorities. In Ben Lohman, he formed an ad hoc pedestrian safety committee and made me the chair. For seven years, we've advocated for speed reduction and three pedestrian priority projects. One on Highway 9 and two on local streets connecting to our village. Um, one of those on the local street would connect directly to 150 homes. The other one would connect to our post office. In finalizing this plan, here's what we'd like you to do. Work with the state to get this prima facie 25 law changed. For instance, Highway 9 also goes through Los Gatos. Last year, an elderly man was killed in the crosswalk in downtown Los Gatos. That, that highway is posted 35 downtown Los Gatos. In the last two weeks, we've had close to one foot of rain in the San Lorenzo Valley. Our roads have turned to rivers. Yes, Highway 9 in the community is rural, and we like it that way, but, it, but this report does not address the serious need for drainage improvements, along with shoulder widening. Removing trees that are obvious hazards, too, have been identified over and over again and I'm pleased to say that the Regional Occupational Program Director at San Lorenzo Valley High School said that if any trees were removed along the highway for safety, he would use those trees to make park and library benches out of libraries and parks in the county. You need to wrap up. Okay, thank you. I'd like to just commend our Demolman Fire Department Board of Directors. They have written a letter uh, supporting certain them, repackaging actually some of the Demolman projects and Sean Castagna, Sean, can you raise your hand? Is here today representing the Dunlum uh, Fire Board. So, for in closing, I would just like to say, let's do some real positive, innovative, but challenging projects in San Luis Valley to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Appreciate that. Here's this letter. Should I give it to from the fire? Board?
Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Brian Largay. I'm a resident of uh, Felton. Uh, and while I uh, did collaborate with the city of Santa Cruz in my land trust employee capacity on those Glenwood trails, and we'd be happy to show them to you at some point, I'm here as a resident of the, of the valley uh, speaking on behalf of my community. Uh, thank you, commissioners and staff, uh, for the honor of providing input today. If you haven't walked down Highway 9 during rush hour, you might give it a try. Uh, on your way from the high school to Felton, uh, you'll have traffic rushing by at arm's length to your left, while your right shoulder brushes against a 15-foot retaining wall. Uh, if you have to walk it every day, as many people in our community do, you'll feel small and vulnerable. And you are. There have been over 100 accidents in the stretch of road by the schools over the past 10 years. <clears throat> a child making that walk every day uh, will get the impression that whoever created this system doesn't value them very much. And the Highway 9 corridor plan, when implemented, will change all of that. It's a wonderful thing. It's a truly impressive compilation of projects. Uh, together, they'll make it vastly safer to walk or bike to school. They'll make it safer to cross the road, to get to the market, or visit neighbors. They'll give people help, healthy choices when they go to work or run errands. It'll help mitigate climate change. The big project of fixing things in front of the schools will solve traffic jams that run for miles and slow down thousands of people on their way to work. <clears throat> uh, not only is the plan fantastic, and it is fantastic, uh, the staff who developed it did an amazing job. Brianna Goodman worked tirelessly to bring it all together, and Rachel Morcone was a terrific project leader. Transportation can be a very mechanical discipline, but the RTC staff who uh, did this job did it with a very human professionalism, which was truly impressive. So my, my request, my ask of the commission, please don't stop now. None of the projects are shovel ready. I urge you to commit in the plan to sustain leadership by the RTC to develop the priority projects at the top of the list and carry them through so they're queued up for construction. There's a fair amount of work left to be done. <clears throat> Only the RTC has the capacity and the interagency network, if I may, just to finish up the point. Thank you very much. Has the capacity and uh, networks of interagency collaboration to bring these projects through given the multiple jurisdictions and very complex nature of doing local projects on the state highway. The 25,000 residents of the San Lorenzo Valley don't ask for very much. We are pretty self-reliant. We don't complain over trivial things that I'm sure you hear on a routine basis from, from lots of other stakeholders. And notably, we don't directly benefit them from the Highway 1 projects or the rail trail projects. Those are um, nice but distant amenities as far as we're concerned. But we absolutely need sustained RTC leadership to implement the quarter plan for Highway 9. The children of the valley will thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate all those comments. Anyone else like to speak on this topic? Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. There's no action required here. This is a presentation. Commissioner Lapp. I want to thank the, thank the staff and the RTC and our partners for the uh, production of this really wonderful plan. And um, two quick comments at the beginning. The, the, the transit district um, sees the San Jose Valley as an urban center. I mean, most, most people think of it as rural. It has that quality. We're not trying to undermine that in any way. But we have uh, urban level demands on, on transit, and it's critical that we spend money in the future to make sure that the bus system is adequate to respond to the needs of the people in the valley. Since a member of the board, I want to make clear that there's a commitment to making sure that that happens. We understand, I mean, people, again, the county people think of this as a rural place. Don't imagine that it really has the level of traffic that it does, but it, it has that level, and it's kind of critical. 
we should make sure, I think, that our um, legislative program includes this idea of the prima facie 25 mile an hour that one of the members of the public spoke to. I think that's really, it's not just here, but it, it's, it's critical here, but it's critical throughout the state that that happened. And, um, the dip, being forced to slow down when you're on your way somewhere from out of town to 25 instead of 35 or 30 miles an hour is not an unreasonable um, uh, demand on somebody when they're going somewhere. And, and the safety level is so much higher when that happens. And so we really should be pressing the legislature to keep that up. Um, then I want to speak personally. Um, you might think that the, those of us that don't live in the valley are only interested in this, you know, from the distance or something. But I, I'm a bicycle rider, and um, I ride my bicycle to Big Basin. Only way to get there is Highway 9. It's, it, um, as I get older and think about mortality, I'm less likely to take that ride than I used to be, although I still do it. And you would think that the scariest part would be where there's like no shoulder and there's no room between the cows. But frankly, I find the most danger when I'm going through the various towns in the valley where people are backing out of spaces into me without looking, or it's not clear where the parking is exactly, or people come, you know, the parking is totally haphazard and you don't know what's going on and that's, and you can't tell, it's really scary and um, I ride it pretty regularly and it, it's, um, it's just, again, the idea, of, I know we don't have the money to, to make the bicycle path all the way along Highway 9 the way we should have eventually, but in the meantime, what we can do in the towns actually is a huge safety factor for those of us riding bicycles in the area. And um, the idea that we, we need to like begin to actually work on these projects, as the last speaker uh, suggested, I think is really critical for us as, a, as an agency. I want to, you know, Bruce's office has done a lot of work to make this stuff happen, but the constituents for this, these improvements are not just people who live in the valley. There are those of us in this county that you know, recreate with bicycles uh, all over, and, and this whole, whole Highway 9 corridor is kind of a critical one. It's, it's, I now take Grand Hill a lot more for the first part of the ride than I used to take Highway 9. I don't know what I was thinking when I was younger, but, but um, and, and I don't recommend people do that if they can take uh, Grand Hill instead, but once you get to Felton, your only choice is to ride along this corridor, and improvements really will make a difference in safety, and, and uh, I personally would appreciate it, these things as they get improved. Thanks for the chance to comment. Mr. Bertrand, I'm going to start this way and work our way around. So it's been a long time since I've lived in um, SLV, and um, for me it was the valley. And I remember when I first came to the valley, I was, um, I was up north end of town, at Boulder Creek, and there was this little map on the counter. And I said, well, what's this little map? And I said, well, a bunch of the residents in the valley put this together, and so I picked it up. It was only a buck, but it really struck me because it was the escape routes. Escape routes through pipe land, people had been identified. And one thing I think is missing in this plan, and maybe I didn't get to see it, is the fact that the valley is very vulnerable to multiple things. I remember many times I came in the valley at night and went Bear Creek, blocked. Highway 9 up, over Los Gatos, blocked. And go through Scotts Valley. Barely. And so you wonder what we need to do to identify a plan that deals with these situations which may be a reality, have been a reality in certain roads. Recently there's a fire on Bear Cook Road, a year and a half ago, I think. So for the residents that live right near there, that's a major problem. So I looked through this plan, but I didn't have enough time, so that's maybe my fault, but I did not see uh, planning for emergency situations. Um, I did look closely at, I tried to look closely at uh, the bike improvements and, you know, going from, I worked at Silicon Systems, I'm in high tech, trying to ride to Silicon Systems on my bike and the blind curves, you know, I had a little kid, I did not want to take those blind curves anymore. So some of the mentions were, well, there's some trees that might have to be removed if we're going to make the bike uh, routes a little bit safer. And so I think that should be a little close yet because um, some of those curves are really blind and some of the trees that make the hillside a little closer to the road, I think should be thought of in terms of pedestrian, excuse me, bike safety. Um, one of the last speakers spoke to something that I was particularly taken with 
when I lived in the valley. Any time I saw an improvement in the valley, I felt really proud. I really felt proud that um, this county decided to do something in the valley to improve our situation. I remember one was at Glen Arbor uh, Bridge there. And that was really nice to see that wall come up and the turns uh, be made better because it was an issue there. So anytime I saw improvement, I felt, wow, this is great. It made me feel much prouder to be in SLE, part of the valley. Thanks. Commissioner Falcon Gilmer. Yes, thank you. Uh, the interest of the Prima Facie 25 uh, interests me. And I think as a commission, we really need to have a further discussion, maybe as, as what the priority needs to be of going up to the state of the legislative changes that we need. We've adopted Vision Zero. We have other things in terms of the safety component that we're trying to adopt in the city limits of Watsonville. And it is a huge concern that we have about the, the being able to have um, the ability to change the speed limits when we know logically people are going in excess of what limits we have to place and the reductions that we need and we're limited on what the legislation tells us that we have the capability of doing. And as a commission for the transportation here, this should be something that we should be supporting to get up to the state and finding all of our communities willing to work together on this because it isn't an isolated problem. And I, I think that as, as a commission, as a body representing this county, um, we should be able to bring that up to the state level for that attention. We have funds from SB1 and uh, the safety items that were out there. And we need to make this as one of the priorities for the commission to help make sure communities have the ability to make these changes that they know that they really desperately need. Um, we've had way too many accidents. We're statistically for Watsonville is a poor community when it comes to the number of accidents that we've had. Even after we've striped everything, we still have it. And it means that there's a huge education component that we're trying to work with. But um, if I can't move the speed sign, um, because of what the state tells us we're incapable of doing, there, there's a real problem that we have here that we need to address as a whole. Um, shovel ready projects, I think that you'll be getting to that pretty shortly for this. I think that will be important to you um, so that then you can prioritize some of the grants that you need uh, for these projects that are here. But um, I'm fully supportive of making sure that all of these concerns do get addressed with the adoption of this policy and look forward to working through the commission and the, the, um, the body that's here um, on getting to the state and getting these things um, reprioritized so that the community has a better say in the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McGill, I, uh, I'd like to follow up that. I appreciate that for both these comments. Um, you know, this, this 25 in, in uh, the downtown area, shall we say, uh, is, it just doesn't hit the San Jose Valley. I mean, even though, as I said, this uh, Highway 9 is Main Street, just mentioned Highway 129 and 152 affects Wattsville. Highway 1 affects Santa Cruz. Uh, I think I would like to get some direction, uh, get some direction maybe to our staff of how we might, uh, or if it would maybe be up to us, how to present something of this nature to the legislature. Uh, it could be focused on um, our county, but uh, I'm sure we'd get some help from other counties like, like Santa Clara, uh, who was mentioned uh, over in Los Gatos. Um, I would like I, I would like to get some uh, get some direction that we put something in, uh, or urge our representatives um, to put something like this in place, uh, and I would be glad to work on it uh, uh, if uh, the commission would agree that we would uh, propose something like this to the legislature. What, what kind of action do we need to, to to give you direction to do that? Well, it's interesting that the next item on our agenda is our legislative agenda um, and our legislative program. We can certainly add it um, to our legislative program um, to, to work to get the California Vehicle Code um, modified for, for this purpose. I think that's an appropriate place to put that, right? Yeah, let me get it around. Well, if it's on this topic. Oh, yeah. I just want to say, I'm not sure the gentleman that spoke about this issue um, said that one in Santa Cruz, they can, on the city streets, they can sort of do what they want. But, you know, we can't do it because it's a state highway. But the problem's bigger than that. And one, one thing I never want to wish on any of you is to be a public official explaining to an audience why you're raising the speed limit in order to be able to enforce it. And they, they showed up to say, we want the cars to go slower. And going, okay, in order to do that, we've got to have a, you know, a nominative speed that people are actually driving. And that means 
And right now they're driving, let's say, 35 in a 25 mile an hour zone. So if you really want to push it further than 30 mile zone, if you really want to have them slow down, the only way to do that is to raise the speed and then, you know, make sure that the average speed, you know, that they actually enforce it at that level and then push it down. And people just think you're crazy when you reach that. And so this is a much bigger issue even than just the state highway, although the state legislation is kind of critical for all of us because that's what's causing this problem. The city of Santa Cruz would lower its speed on a lot of city streets, not state highways, if we could do it without having to raise the speed first 10 miles an hour to make that happen, which is, again, it's not counterintuitive. It's too fancy a word to use for what's just insane if you find yourself in a public meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Brown? <coughs> I just want to say thanks to our staff and to all the people who have um, participated in this process. It's really great to see um, this uh, attention given to the Highway 9 corridor. We get, pay a lot of attention to that other corridor in the county that um, has, has taken up a lot of our time and efforts um, these past couple of years that I've been on the, the commission um, for good reason. Um, but And so Highway 9 seems to be overshadowed a lot in this, and I'm just really pleased that some attention is being given now. I'm really pleased to see that we may actually get to um, shovel-ready projects around um, pedestrian safety and you know crosswalks, lighting, striping, um, and really... Um, really focus here, so, and I look forward to working with the community. I know this is not the most ideal time for the public to turn out for a hearing, but I'm really glad to um, hear that we've had opportunities for public input, and I encourage members of the uh, San Lorenzo Valley communities to um, be in touch with us for the, you know, the final, um, this 30-day this comment period, and look forward to um, hearing more about it in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Schiffer, any comments? Okay. Commissioner Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank the leadership of uh, the Supervisor McPherson's office and the RTC for holding these community meetings. Um, and I also want to thank the San Lorenzo Valley community for coming out. When you have hundreds of people coming out to uh, participate in local decisions, you get better decisions. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that we have the foresight to put $10 million into this. It's obviously not enough. Um, but that's a problem we have in all of our roads. Uh, the county uh, road system is 600 miles, and sometimes my colleagues in cities uh, think it's easy to figure out how we would uh, fund that 600-mile road repair. Um, but until we had things like Measure D and SB1, we didn't have a chance to do it. We're, we're still challenged because we have to pay the bill on the 2017 storm damage repair. But once we get through that, and assuming we don't have some other uh, crisis to fall us, we'll actually have a lot more money to just start investing in our local roads. And so to make roads safer for pedestrians and bicyclists is critical. I know that's number, one of the number one issues in my district. And I'm glad to see a community-driven plan coming to fruition and us to start to be able to invest in it um, to make a difference in the lives of so many people. So thank you for everyone who was involved with that. And I'm going to be su supporting um, everything we can with this. Commissioner Gard. Commissioner Cabot couldn't make it because he's served on jury duty. But he's always been a, a, an advocate or a supporter of uh, grants like CPRAS to schools. I'm sure you'd want to convey that uh, you'd support any measure that would improve traffic safety at uh, high school, San Lorenzo Valley High School or uh, San Lorenzo Valley Middle School. Thank you. Commissioner Mulhern. Uh, thank you. Um, just to just throw the information into the public discussion, uh, speed limit is established under the vehicle code by engineering and traffic studies. Um, so if, if the speed limit doesn't match what the engineering and traffic studies say that it, say it should be, uh, the, that area is considered a speed trap um, and is unenforceable under the vehicle code. So something else to consider in the process is not just uh, we eyeball traffic coming through town, we think it's too fast, we're going to lower the speed 25 miles per hour. There's a regulatory framework that uh, is established for establishing uh, speed limits. Thank you for that point. I, I think it's been brought up by others that the, the, the speed, uh, setting speed limits in cities is a very complicated issue. And although we may see there's a need to do that, it, it, it's something that sometimes out of our control. Before I close this up, Commissioner Schiff, you have something to say? Yes. Um, I wasn't going to say anything because I was in agreement with what everybody else was saying. 
but um, since everybody said something, I feel I should <laughs> add something maybe to uh, help in a practical way. I think when this comes back, it would be helpful to have uh, a work program, perhaps, or a timeline that sort of set out what the projects along um, that are upcoming. There is $10 million. There are grants out there. I think it would be helpful in tracking the progress of implementing the plan, which is really the hard part, uh, the hardest part, getting money, doing the projects, um, and getting a, more details in terms of what the timeline is, what the priority projects are, and getting a list of uh, how we're moving forward um, might be helpful to the commission and to the community in sort of getting a sense of when some of the high priority projects are going to happen and you know what the priority list is. That would be my suggestion when this comes back. Ms. Lowe, go ahead, Maya. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would just like to highlight the um, continued value of the partnership in this effort. As you've witnessed, this is a great partnership in the planning phase. It will be as important as we go forward into the prioritization and the implementation and even the maintenance uh, of these uh, new excuse me, of the new facilities. So the, there was reference to opportunities that may come up with storm damage restoration or maintenance projects. And I would like to say that partnership on those would still be very important. There's uh, similar to, not dissimilar to speed zoning and speed law. Um, there's, there's laws that influence how money is spent and so on. A lot of the storm damage were prevented from upgrading things. So what, what this plan does is it helps us determine where our priorities are and then when these opportunities come that we're still partnering on the funding and the implementation going forward. So I just, I really see this as a, um, as a model for partnership going forward and I really appreciate the effort here. Great, thank you for those comments. Uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, what everybody has said, but I think the one thing that we need to remind you know, the people in San Luis Valley is that this commission did take action by supporting Measure D and allocating the $10 million, and I believe that's what's getting this ball rolling, and, and from there we can only grow, so uh, it's a great project for, for everybody. So with that... Um, if you may, I'd like to just reply to three points. Please do. Um, to Commissioner Schifrin's point on the implementation plan, Chapter 4 of the document does include suggestions on ongoing short-term, mid-term, and long-term improvements. We did, we're specifically soliciting public comments on that during the open houses on what folks thought need to be moved forward or back, and I encourage the commissioners also to provide that input by the comment deadline of next week if possible. If you think things are in the wrong spot, that would be helpful. Um, Chapter 2 does include reference to emergency responses. Um, it's project number F. In the, in the plan, and so in chapter two, you can find that. And then um, on the next item, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the speed limit reduction, so. Okay, we well, might as well stay right there because our next item will be the uh, state, federal, and legislative programs. Uh, with that, go ahead. Fantastic, well thank you commissioners again for putting up with listening to me growing up here for a little bit longer. Um, and again, thank you everyone in the community who came out to the public hearing on the San Rosa Valley plan. Um, so the commission as the regional transportation agency and as an agency wanting to keep track of what's happening at the state and federal level that might impact our ability to do our jobs and address the transportation needs of our community does annually adopt a state and federal legislative program. Um, this program is uh, provides guidance to staff and commissioners when um, bills are proposed, administrative um, modifications are made, um, if new funding programs come forward on how to comment on those proposals, um, whether we want to take positions of support or opposition to proposals at the state and federal legislative level or administrative level. Um, and so it's really helpful for us to have this adopted every year. Um, we work with our partners through the California Council of Governments, CalCog, um, the Central Coast Coalition, um, partners at the League of Cities and California State Association of Counties, the Self-Help Counties Coalition. Um, as well as all of our local jurisdictions here um, that are uh, uh, represented, that all of you represent on this board um, as proposals come forward and so that we can work collectively to address um, key issues. 
Our legislative proposals for 2019 focus on things that we've seen in the past. Um, prior to Senate Bill 1 being passed a ma and Measure D being passed, a major focus was the fact that the cost to operate, maintain, and improve our transportation system um, exceeds the amount of funding available. Even with those um, measures, that problem has not been completely resolved, and so we continue to include in the legislative program um, looking at options to uh, address all the funding needs of our transportation system, um, but also make sure that the funding that's there now is not taken away. And so um, that includes funds like Senate Bill 1, um, our ability to use other funding sources, whether it's Active Transportation Program funds, Transportation Development Act funds, um, federal programs that are critically important to safety and bridge maintenance on our road system. Um, so there's a lot of our both state and federal legislative programs focus on making sure that those funds that we need to operate and maintain our system are not threatened. Um, Commissioner McPherson mentioned earlier that in the governor's initial pro budget proposal for fiscal year 1920, um, he suggested that, sorry, 1920, no, 1920. 2020. The 2020. 2019. Sorry, I somehow woke up at four in the morning. The dog was being a complete jerk last night. I'm working off minimal sleep here. I'm leaving it on the dog. It ate my homework also. No. Um, uh, so, based on that, the governor had proposed linking the money that cities and counties get for um, road local streets and roads to how much housing they're producing. Everyone in the state is very concerned about that. Um, there's an item in our legislative program opposing efforts that would try to link um, transportation dollars to non-transportation um, issues. Um, and then we also would like to see a lot of streamlining. The it costs a lot and it takes a long time to do some transportation projects and we want to look with and work with our partners at um, state agencies and federal agencies to look at how we could expedite the process, whether it's through the environmental review process or permitting process, um, project development processes, and so that's also a, a key component of our legislative program. And then of course we have items in our legislative program that are specifically focused on the Regional Transportation Commission's abilities to do its jobs and meet the priorities identified by this commission. Um, as far as implementing projects, planning efforts, um, but also our concern with any time the state develops a new, um, or the feds develop a new transportation related legislative action, that oftentimes those mandates are unfunded and that is a concern because it makes it more challenging for everyone to do their job. So with that, I'm just gonna focus on a few things specifically that are in the legislative program, which starts on page 18-5 of your um, packet. As I mentioned earlier, kind of midway down that just above ensure fair distribution of funding is the item that focuses on opposing proposals that could tie transportation fund availability, especially highway user um, tax account, the gas tax funds to local jurisdictions to non-transportation and development projects. Um, on the second page of the legislative program, um, we are, at the bottom, they're looking to address some proposals on the active transportation program, which um, some of our larger sister agencies in the state are looking to take more of the funds by formula, which would leave less funding available for um, our local jurisdictions to compete for those funds. And so, of course, we want to make sure that any reforms that are proposed to that program um, do not diminish our ability to access funds. Um, as far as the cap and trade program, similar to what you have seen in uh, Santa Cruz Metro's legislative program, we're concerned that the California Air Resources Board has put some pretty strict timelines on um, converting vehicle fleets, and we want to make sure that they do not um, put an undue burden on transit agencies. Um, on, and then another new item here is to increase and preserve funding for priority projects in Santa Cruz County. We've added to the list that we've had in the past the SoCal Avenue and Freedom Boulevard corridor um, related to your decisions on the Unified Corridor Investment Study. Other projects that were part of that um, remain on that priority list. And then the next item in there is the Transportation Development Act. 
Um, in August, Senator Bell and Assemblyman Frazier, who chair the um, State Assembly and Senate Transportation Commission Committees, tasked the California Transit Association with pulling together a task force of transit operators, regional agencies, and the, the governor's administration to um, look at transportation, the Transportation Development Act. Their focus was on the fact that they were getting um, spot bills from different, or not spot bills, actual bills from different um, agencies throughout the state trying to adjust the fare box recovery ratio and the performance metrics there. Um, the task force has not yet met. They're going to start meeting in early March. And um, there are a lot of different ideas about how the Transportation Development Act could be um, modified or um, amended. And um, some of those include proposals that could reduce funds for um, Metro, for Lift Line, for um, Bike to Work, the Community Traffic Safety Coalition, the Volunteer Center, as well as the Regional Transportation Commission. So we're recommending that we uh, oppose any modifications, whether it's to the fare box recovery ratio and what counts as revenues, or um, to how the commission um, designates those funds to projects. Um, on the page 18-8 of your packet, I just wanted to highlight two more things there. On the um, active transportation facilities, kind of midway down, there is a new um, bill proposed by Scott Wiener of San Francisco, Senate Bill 127, which would mandate that the state-owned roadways um, address bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Um, so that's a bill that we're going to be tracking. We, of course, want to see integration of bicycle and pedestrian um, improvements wherever possible. So I just wanted to highlight that that's a component of that. At the bottom of the page on safety, and this came up at the last item, um, on the last item, the, there's an asterisk next to the second to last line there that says um, support proposals that would allow local jurisdictions to reduce speed limits. And I would like to suggest that we modify that to clarify after the word speed limits, um, that it say on local roads and the state route system. Um, last year, there was a bill approved, AB 2363, which established a statewide um, task force that's going to be convened by July 1st of, of this year, which is a zero traffic fatality, uh, fatalities task force. And one of the um, subjects of that task force is looking at this rule that prohibits folks to um, reduce the speed limit. And so an option would be um, if if the commission desires to try to um, utilize some of our, our budget to get staff on that committee, that, that would be a way to do it, or encourage some of our active community members or commissioners themselves to see if there's a way for us to get on that task force or at least participate in those task force committee meetings. Another option would be for the commission to work with some of our partners to author a bill and propose that and, and kind of jump ahead of this task force. Um, but I think that the task force is the way that they, it, it's your best chance probably of actually having something go through and not get vetoed. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation. It will take a little bit longer than if you had great success on, on a, a bill. But um, as Commissioner Mulhern mentioned, there are some challenges to just modifying the speed limit and ensuring that we're not unduly reducing speed limits that are um, creating other challenges. Um, uh, the legislative program um, on the federal side, we are, of course, very concerned about the shutdown. Um, item 13 in your packet talked about some of the impacts that the shutdown had, um, the gover federal government shutdown. Um, some of that's going to trickle out for quite a while. Um, there are a lot of people out of work that are now coming back to inboxes that have even larger stacks of paper in them, and they still need to um, do their due diligence to make sure that permits, resource agency permits aren't issued unduly, that um, funds keep flowing to everyone. And so we're, we're going to keep monitoring that. I mean, we're kind of on a temporary reprieve right now, but we want to make sure that the funding dollars that we need for all of our different programs keep flowing. Um, 
We're also concerned, uh, we had some major storm damage, of course, that was mentioned earlier, especially in 2017. I'm sure there's some that is coming forward this winter as well. And, and we're concerned that there have been some proposals floated to redirect emergency response funds from emergencies that are more than a year or two old to um, some other emergency that um, someone might think is a current emergency. So we want to make sure that the funds that were previously promised for, you know, whatever kind of emergencies have happened in California stay available for those um, projects and are not shifted to other things. The County of Santa Cruz especially has a huge um, FEMA list, but so does the Regional Transportation Commission. We're trying to get reimbursement for some storm damage on the rail line. And then finally, on the federal program about midway through uh, page 18-12 is reauthorization. Um, the federal government reauthorizes the um, the Transportation Act every three to five years, depending on the cycle. The current um, Transportation Act, the FAST Act, is um, expires in 2020. There's a chance that there'll be continuations of that bill, but um, federal committees, congressional and Senate committees have started to meet to talk about reauthorization of the bill. We want to make sure that whatever bill comes forward um, meets the needs of our county and does not unduly focus the funds only on the major metropolitan areas, for instance, and the programs that are essential to our local jurisdictions and transit agency and the Regional Transportation Commission remain in place. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or turn it over to the commission. Yeah. Any questions? This is a pretty technical question. Yeah, no, no, what do we start asked? down here? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Ms. Coffin, go Thank you. Um, let's see. There's uh, an item 18-5. It says explore next steps on the ruling. Um, and this has to do with the tax on the Dakota versus Wayfair. Do we have any idea of how much of our revenue is being lost and what we may be able to uh, recover uh, with something to be implemented along this? Because I know that this is all be online and versus brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. Anything like that that we know about? You know, we actually have a meeting with one of the um, our, our taxing authority consultants um, next week, I want to, really soon, and so we'll have a better estimate on those numbers. Part of the issue around the Wayfair, um, for some of our sister agencies that have large warehouses like big Amazon distribution centers, for them, you know, they have a, a different perspective of how the tax should be um, distributed versus you know, in our county where we don't have those major distribution centers, we want to make sure we're not losing our Measure D and other sales tax revenue. So um, we can get back to you on that. And then I know that the, the definition of uh, disadvantaged communities has come up more than, more than once. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know, uh, how do we use that for calculating purposes? And what are we looking to do on um, changing the language that would affect calculating? Sure. So um, there's... Depending on the grant program, the definition of disadvantaged community varies. So for housing programs, it's, um, I would say, a little bit more sane than what has been put forward for transportation programs and specifically for the cap-and-trade program. For the cap-and-trade program, um, it looks at some very, I think it's something like 40 different criteria. Um, low birth rate comes into effect, you know, what are pollution levels, um, as well as what income and some of your more standard um, issues that you would consider part of disadvantaged community. Um, the result, because of the way our county is, um, which is fantastic, that it's very integrated, we don't have a lot of pockets of um, really poor census districts completely separated from multi-million dollar houses, is that our averages end up in such a way that only one section of Watsonville, and that's the section south of 152, kind of bordered by 152, Highway 1, and um, the Pajaro River, qualify as disadvantaged in our county. Well, we know we have folks in our county that are very low income, transit dependent, um, you know, have limited services, and, and need funding, and, and what happens is that we have a harder time competing for a lot of different grants because of that definition. And so we're looking to have that definition be something more like what we were successful 
um, at achieving for the active transportation program where you can look at income levels, you can look at how many students are receiving free or reduced lunches, um, a regional definition that might look at smaller areas than just census block or, um, so those are some of the issues there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll keep it short. I, I encourage people or, or for us to move forward and be participating with the task force. Um, I think that it's pretty evident with this commission that we want to really look at um, the safety and the speeds, um, whether it's it's the highways or the local streets. Um, we definitely have that. Do we ever do any federal legislative visits? I, I know, like, for example, Metro goes to D.C. Do, do we do this as a commission? I, I'm not sure. I'm not moving up on that. Uh, if, if I might, uh, commissioners, in the past, the uh, commission has done that uh, the executive director typically uh, would go to the uh, to Washington D.C. and for the Transition Research Board conference. And as part of that, there would be visits with the uh, federal legislative uh, representatives in Washington D.C. And that typically depends on whether there's something uh, going on that the this commission could advocate for to uh, help not just the Transportation Commission, but other uh, partners of the Transportation Commission in improving transportation centers. Thank you. Thank you. Questions down there? Commissioner Robinson. First question. My first question is technical. There's a bunch of asterisks in this report. Do they need to put those somewhere? Because I couldn't find it. <laughs> At the very top of the legislative programs, it, it notes that um, items that are new or different either have an asterisk or underline. So other things were carried forward from the prior year. Okay. Um, we do have a lobbyist in D.C. Um, we actually share a lobbyist, I believe, with the Transit District. They, um, at least that was the case last year. And um, they let us know when there's, they need someone to go there and talk uh, as a, more than they can do just as, uh, as, our, as our big lobbyist in D.C. So that's an important part of our program, I think. Yeah, and on that note, um, the second attachment to your packet is a memo from Chris Giglio at Capital Edge. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for putting this together. I, had a, a, I, uh, I strongly support this idea of, the, of, of disconnecting housing production with our transportation funding, because sometimes we actually need to build the infrastructure to be able to support the housing. Uh, we want to build it, uh, among other things. Um, I'm wondering if you have any insight. The governor also, in his uh, budget message, talked about um, removing the vote requirement for enhanced financing infrastructure districts, which are is sort of a redevelopment light. Mm -hmm. um, and what's your, I don't know whether you have any sense about that, whether that would have legs this year, um, whether it would whether it would generate any, any real money? Um, you know, we do have that in the LEDGE program under 18-6, expand the authority of the RTC and local entities to increase taxes and fees. Um, I think, right, right. So both of those. Um, I think that there is support among some legislators. I think that there's also others who want to make sure that we're being really thoughtful when we're increasing fees on different areas. Um, whether or not it has legs, I mean, the fact that the governor is bringing it up shows that he would sign a bill if it comes forward. But my understanding. Is is that the enhanced financing infrastructure districts aren't new fees. They're, they're keeping a portion of our taxes similar in the way that, that redevelopment did, not at the same amount of that tax increment financing, but uh, keeping our tax dollars here in the community instead of going up there. So it actually doesn't cost us um, anything. The, the, the question is whether it generates enough money. You can, uh, the, the way the legislation is currently written is you have to get a vote of the people Right. In order to set it up, and that's that's a hurdle. I think there's only one of these districts statewide. Maybe there's two, um, and it would be a good tool, uh, especially uh, for us here at the uh, at the RTC, because um, there's there's a lot uh, stricter limitations of how you can spend the money, and uh, roads is one of those, right? Uh, the transportation infrastructure. So. The idea of being able to keep some of our tax money here and, um, and, and put it into our transportation infrastructure would benefit us all. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested to see where that goes. Yeah, let me follow up with the local jurisdictions and the planning and public works departments to see where they may have already, already identified some of those zones and how it could be helpful to us. Um, do you have this item in here about the Transportation Development Act? 
and um, it's and you have the asterisk that tells me something's new about it. Um, uh, and you talked about it, uh, uh, but you say that TDA funds are essential for RTC administration and planning. Could you remind us a little bit? Sure, sure. So um, the Regional Transportation Commission, as the Regional Transportation Planning Agency, um, utilizes Transportation Development Act funds for regional planning and coordination. Um, the TDA was established in 1971, I believe, um, with the focus on providing funding for transit and regional planning. Um, in For the Regional Transportation Commission, we use about $1.1 million a year for administrative and planning purposes to implement the budget and work program that's established by the Regional Transportation Commission. Um, so proposals that would either eliminate or reduce those funds um, would be a significant um, impact on our budget. Our overall operating budget is about $4 million a year. So um, if those funds went away, we would be seeing about a 25% cut overall. Besides the RTC, do other jurisdictions get TDA funds? Yeah, so in our in our county, um, the Transportation Commission approved through its rules and regulations a formula for distribution of those funds. Um, the TDA Act um, also establishes what you can use those funds on. Um, in our county, uh, or statewide, the off-the-top amounts are for administration of the TDA program and regional planning, um, followed by transit, um, paratransit, and community um, transportation service agencies like LiftLine. Um, in our county, we also utilize about $130,000 a year, I want to say, for the Community Traffic Safety Coalition to do bicycle and pedestrian safety and education programs, about $60,000 for the bike to work program. Um, lift lines portion, I want to say is about 700,000 a year. So it's a pretty significant amount of their budget as well. Um, and then we provide some money to the volunteer center to operate their volunteer driver program, which is um, very important for folks, especially if they have out of county medical appointments. And of course the Metro gets a, the, the largest. Correct, amount. Metro receives about 70% um, of the total funds and over 85% of the formula funds that are available after what the commission needs for administration and planning. Uh, well, I, I think um, I, uh, when it comes time to a motion, I want to talk about that because I realize uh, in, uh, when we did last week, the transit board did their legislative agenda or I could say our legislative agenda. And we, we approved language that, that would have some shifts in here. And I think it would be worthwhile to have something where we weren't cannibalizing each other. We were, we were working to increase the whole rather than um, uh, trying to drop Peter to pay Paul. So when it comes time, the chair, after the testimony. Right. Yeah. Questions, uh, Commissioner Gregorio? Um, so a uh, capital edge is like a federal lobbyist. Is it uh, is that the same term we uh, use for the state level lobbyist or or do you um, use somebody else? Just to be clear, there are, are federal assistant, not all lobbyists. But <laughs> um, they um, no, they they their focus is in Washington D.C. They're located in Washington D.C. Their connections are in D.C. They help us out with things like the Surface Transportation Board. FEMA, um, other federal agencies, as well as legislative issues on the federal level. We currently do not have a state legislative assistant um, contract. Commissioner Moore. Uh, thank you. Uh, what, what is our current authority for raising taxes and fees? Or rather, which, which taxes and fees are we allowed to uh, raise or lower at the RTC? I believe, boy, you should have asked me this three years ago when we were working on measure D. And I had it all in the back of my head. Yeah, and sales tax is the main one. Um, there have been some spot bills about increasing gas taxes at a uh, regional level. Um, currently, I think that the Metropolitan Transportation Commission over the hill is the only one that has that authority. Uh, Luis, can you remember any other ones? Well, something we've we worked on in the past is the possibility of having the RTC uh, be able to increase uh, vehicle registration fees. Because right. uh, that, that's something that's available to many uh, local agency transportation um, commissions in the state that are not available to the RTC. Um, we've made efforts to, to 
change that that hasn't happened yet. Um, yeah, that's Senate Bill eighty three cleanup, which is also in our legislative program. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Ms. Lowe, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, in your program um, on page eighteen eight, there's a reference there also to the shop program, and I would just like to clarify uh, there's commonly a reference to the O in SHOP, and the SHOP stands for the State Highway Operations and Protection Program. And for many years, we have not been able to fund operational improvements simply as a, um, because of a math problem, cash flow. Safety has always come first, and uh, pavement, bridge, and some of these very essential assets. So operations has not been something that we've been able to get around to funding. With SB1 and uh, transitions that we're seeing. Once we get this backlog cleared, we think that there will be more opportunities to fund operational improvements. So I just want to clarify that it's not a problem with the law. There's not a legal problem. There was just a cash flow problem. Uh, we are also working uh, very diligently now to experiment with uh, performance-driven measures uh, to better um, determine priorities for operational improvements going forward. And I would also mention that with regard to active transportation, the state has an active transportation plan and the district is just now kicking off our uh, District 5 active transportation plan, which will establish priorities uh, for complete streets and working in partnership, as I said. Uh, one of the, one of the um, challenges there is as the shop is driven by meeting performance targets, there is not presently a performance target for complete streets. So the performance targets are all asset um, driven, so I just kind of make that clarification. We'll keep our fingers crossed for additional funding. Thank you for your mic on. Oh, thank you. So, um, the unfunded mandates bullet seems to be uh, ubiquitous in um, most um, of these kinds of reports that we get up there to see under local jurisdictions. Um, and I don't see any asterisks or underlines in it, so is that? It's been there for there years. It's, a, it's there in the event that we that unfunded mandates come to us in particular in the form of particular legislation, and we our our state partners just scour the transportation related legislation to apprise us. Correct time to okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public now for any comment on the our legislative programs. You did good last night, last time you stimulated the crowd, so. <laughs> Yannicka Strauss, Spike Santa Cruz County, again. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple things that Rachel mentioned, which are uh, AB, one, or sorry, SB 127, um, which is the complete streets on our highways, uh, our uh, complete streets on our town highways. Um, and then also to highlight that uh, we also support a representative on the Vision Zero Task Force um, and then also working to um, change the disadvantaged communities definition. And um, I actually am a representative on the California Bicycle Coalition monthly phone calls and they're um, the state bike lobbyist, if you will. So. Um, I'd, I'd love to support our efforts here locally um, on the state level as much as possible with that. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else like to uh, speak on this topic? Okay, we'll bring it back for uh, discussion. Commissioner Rockin. I will start by moving approval of both the uh, federal and state legislative programs before comment. Um, second. Yes, yeah, second. Um, the point that John Leopold, Director Leopold raised um, about the um, TDA funding issue, um, the Transit District did pass a, uh, an action that basically said all of the funding should go to the Transit District. I think that slipped by a bunch of us on the board. It slipped by me for sure, I'll, I'll make that clear. Um, since then, there have been, uh, I'm trying to sort of preempt a very long discussion, which hopefully won't be necessary, but uh, both um, Alex Clifford, and um, Guy Preston have been talking about this issue and um, had to resolve it. And um, at this point there, uh, the transit district, I think, will end up supporting the, the language that's in the uh, RTC proposal in front of us. 
this morning. However, the discussions might lead to some other modification, in which case we come back to us for some modification of our legislative program. I don't think we should try and amend it today. I think we should just approve the language in front of us. But knowing that that's getting worked out, I think we've had a very good relationship so far with the, uh, between uh, Guy Preston and Alice Clifford, and I'd like to continue that and not have this become some kind of a public battle over funding. I don't think we have to go there. And so um, I think approval of this language today will be fine. I think we'll ask them to get back to us if they want to make any modifications. But I think whatever comes back will be a joint proposal from the two of them rather than a battle going on between two agencies, which we should avoid at all costs. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to clarify that, because to your point and Commissioner Leopold's point, the language from the two agencies are opposing language, and we don't want to get in the middle of that. So I think the direction, which I think you basically hinted at, which we can give to staff, is staff is having ongoing conversations with Metro, and I would uh, encourage staff, staff to continue those conversations and work towards an agreement where there's a complete, you know, better understanding of TDA, of how it comes from the state, how it's distributed and how these two agencies are going to get along without having any problems because we are duly represented on both of these boards so we'll just leave it at that with your motion uh, just some clarification are you willing to accept the uh, language about changing the speed limits this was mentioned mentioned by uh, Rachel McCarney. yes that's and correct. the idea of a task force that's friendly as well as well as and the last was the distant advantage communities I think we all those are any other discussion from uh, Seeing that, well, well, I'll, uh, Chair, oh. just a question. I support uh, the Chair's motion, and I think it makes sense uh, the, that in, the, in our community that we have our transit and transportation agencies work well together. And should we expect that we're going to see something here or there in the future? I, I'm just, I wasn't sure exactly how that was. I, I think what, what, what my direction to staff was, uh, they, they're having discussions right now, so we're encouraging those ongoing discussions and, and for them to work it out, which I think until we see on either agency that there seems to be a problem, I think at this point it's better that we just let the two agencies work this out. Okay, well, uh, wanna, can I suggest that we just get an update in our next executive director report um, about this, whether it be at the TPW or our regular, so we can so, so we can just keep be kept aware of it. I think we can just say at the director's report there'll always be an update on this topic until there is uh, some kind of resolution. That's good. Is that satisfying? That's good. We'll, we'll make that part of the motion. And the second is coming. Aye. Thank you. With that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So that brings us to uh, our next meeting. Will be on. Get to that. March 7th at the uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors Chambers and we are adjourned.